Good morning church family. So nice to be able to bring you another installment from the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get straight into the scripture this morning. We'll start in chapter 18 at verse 24. And we'll read all the way through to chapter 19 and verse 7. Let's read together. A Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was powerful in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately, although he knew only John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Corinth, the brothers wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism were you baptized with? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about twelve men in all. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for the beautiful surroundings this morning. We thank you for your beautiful word. And we depend on you to speak to our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage we have two accounts which are linked by Luke for a purpose. They are linked geographically, both took place in Ephesus. They are linked theologically, both Apollos and the twelve disciples knew only John's baptism. And they are linked by an implied question which points to Luke's purpose. The question which we will investigate is whether these men were saved and spirit-filled before their encounters with Priscilla and Aquila and Paul. As we cover the passage, I hope to provide a number of tools for interpreting biblical texts. The first is a very simple one. Ignore section headings in your Bibles. You probably have a heading at the top of chapter 19, which essentially separates it from the preceding content. One of the greatest reasons that we have difficulty with our interpretation is that we have created artificial divisions in our modern Bibles which can hinder us from appreciating the full context of each verse, paragraph and passage. As with verse and chapter numbers, section headings are not part of the original Greek text and the authors of scripture would not have wanted us to modularize their message. I'm not advocating for doing away with the divisions, but rather allowing them to be helps and not hindrances to our interpretation. The point is to realize that these two passages are intimately linked, despite being in separate chapters and under separate headings. Let's continue by looking at the account involving Apollos. I really enjoyed this brief insight into a new character in the story particularly because it is a reminder that the Holy Spirit was working through many individuals in many ways and diverse places and not only along the route of Paul's missions. While scripture captures the essence of God's work, it does not capture the totality of his work. God works in innumerable ways throughout his world and we should be careful not to limit, not to limit God and his acts to only that which is recorded. If we do, what about our part in the story? 
Apollos was an educated man who came from the most intellectual city of the day, Alexandria, and he used his education in the service of the Lord. In verse 28, we see that Apollos became extremely influential through the faithful use of his gifts. Verses 24 and 25 highlight specific traits which contributed to his success. We are told that he was eloquent, that he was fervent, and that he also brought his messages with a unique power. The word eloquent, logios in Greek, is related to the word logos and means a fluent and compelling orator. Apollos had the gift of the gab, as well as the determination to use it for God's honor in extending his kingdom. The second adjective attributed to Apollos is that he spoke powerfully. The Greek word is dunatos, which is closely linked with the word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. Or I should say that that word eventually evolved from the word dunamis. The word is used three times in the book of Romans to signify God's ability to fulfill his purpose. So it's very much linked with God's provision in the scriptures. For anyone who might be interested, I find that Esaud is an excellent tool for interrogating words in the original languages, as well as for finding the number of times and various different contexts in which they are used. Apollos was not only gifted with eloquence, but he was also blessed with God's enabling so that his words had an effect and brought about kingdom building change in his hearers. Finally, Apollos was fervent. The Greek word is zeo, which literally means to boil. It is from this idea that the phrase on fire for God likely comes. There is much that we can learn from Apollos, and one important lesson comes from this third adjective. Are we a people who could be described as fervent? Are we on fire for God? What excites you, friends? Is it the things of God, or is it more often the things in this world? Are you at least as fervent for God and His purposes as you are about your favorite sports team? or your home, or your pets? Can we combine enthusiasm for God and His truth with excellence in handling His message, as Apollos did? Apollos brings a great challenge to us, and I hope it's something that we can all contemplate as we leave from hearing this message, as we go into our week, come back to that question, and allow the Holy Spirit to convict and to guide in how he might desire to change us, mold us into those who are more passionate, on fire, boiling for, him, for God and for his purposes. Returning to our question, despite Apollos not having been baptized in Jesus' name, we are told that he knew only John's baptism. Was he a Christian? Was he filled with the Holy Spirit? Based on the adjectives that we have discussed, particularly the fact that he was enabled by God to share the word with effective power, and the fact that he was on fire, literally boiling with the Spirit's enthusiasm, and finally the fact that the phrase fervent in spirit could also be translated as fervent in the spirit, the answer seems to be a resounding yes. He was a believer. This is also confirmed by the manner in which Priscilla and Aquila approached him. They saw Apollos as a believer who needed to be more fully informed. They did not see an unbeliever who needed to be saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit. We have already seen in Acts, through a similar passage covered by Carl, Acts 8, that being filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit is synonymous with salvation. The sealing of the Spirit takes place the moment someone confesses and believes that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Two verses by way of reminder. Acts 11:17 says, God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord 
except in the Holy Spirit. There is one more very encouraging lesson that I would like us to take from Apollos. Despite his ignorance of a certain aspect of the faith, Apollos was used by the Lord. Isn't this good news for us? Not knowing or having experienced everything about God does not limit our usefulness to Him. You may not have been baptized, but you are as much a Christian as someone who has, despite your missing experience. You may not yet have a theological qualification, but as long as you know the gospel sufficiently, you can be used by God. I'm not at all justifying a lack of experience or of knowledge, but I am highlighting God's grace and His mercy with our weakness and limitations. Luke makes clear that there was nothing significantly lacking in Apollos' faith and that he was useful to God despite what he lacked. I certainly was extremely encouraged by this reminder. In chapter 9 now, Luke introduces a group of men who, like Apollos, only knew John's baptism. Were these men Christians despite their ignorance? There are several significant indicators that they had not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and had therefore not received the Holy Spirit. We should first consider one potential evidence to the contrary, and that is the unqualified use of the word disciples to describe them in verse 1. Today, this word has become synonymous with Christianity. It is difficult to imagine a word that more accurately describes a genuine Christian. However, at that time, discipleship was a common practice and there were as many kinds of disciples as there were spiritual leaders. These men have become known as disciples of John the Baptist, first because of what they did know, John's baptism of repentance, but more importantly because of what they lacked, which indicates that they were not yet disciples of Jesus. How can we know that these men were not Christians? Paul's approach to them is an important clue. On meeting these men, he did not assume that they were Christians, and there was something that led him to ask a couple of very significant questions. His first question in verse 2 reveals that these men had not received the Holy Spirit. In fact, they confess complete ignorance in this regard. Paul's second question reveals two further realities. First, the material fact that these men did not know about their need to be baptized in Jesus' name, and more importantly, the spiritual reality that Paul had to confront them with their fundamental need to believe in Jesus. In verse 4 we read, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. This is one way of presenting the gospel, and it is evident that Paul had enough information to justify this presentation. These men had not yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they had not received the Holy Spirit. Whilst Apollos lacked some truth, these men lacked significant truth, as well as genuine Christian experience. And so Paul instructs them and baptizes them based on their confession of Jesus. It is important to understand that some people use this text as a justification that baptism by the Holy Spirit, accompanied by miraculous gifts of tongues, is a necessary and secondary experience in the life of a believer. Their main evidence is what appears to be a small chronological gap between verse 5, when they accept Jesus, and verse 6, when they manifest the sign gifts of prophecy and tongues. Those who hold this view also assert that the laying on of hands by man is the catalyst to this secondary experience. These assertions cannot be supported by scripture when interpreted, when interpreted holistically, but they also cannot be supported by this text. Let's consider just three reasons. First, there is a lot of information that we are not given. This is true both in the account of Apollos 
as well as in the account of the Twelve Disciples. We must be very careful about the assumptions we make in order to fill in the blanks of texts such as these. If we do make assumptions, as is sometimes necessary to help our interpretation, they must always be based on doctrine attested elsewhere in Scripture. This approach is based on the important principle of interpretation that is based on the clear interpreting the unclear, or put another way, the obvious must always interpret the obscure. Related to this is the fact that these passages are descriptive and not prescriptive, as we have seen many times throughout the book of Acts. They describe what happened then, they do not necessarily prescribe what must always happen. Nowhere in either text is there a command or directive to do things in a certain way. Another rule for accurate interpretation is that doctrine should not be established based solely on descriptive texts. Lastly, the text in chapter 9 describes a unique and unusual situation that required unique and special treatment. The purpose of the text, in the context of Acts, is to highlight the essential reality of the indwelling Holy Spirit as the mark of a genuine Christian. This mark, which was evident in Apollos, had not yet been experienced by the twelve disciples of John. The fact that their Christian baptism and confession of Jesus was marked by miraculous sign gifts, along with the laying on of Paul's hands, are intended as evidence that these men had moved from a position as unbelievers to being a part of the church, no longer would they be called disciples of John, but disciples of Jesus. The conclusion is that we should not attempt to establish a pattern based on a text that does not fulfill the requirements for establishing Christian doctrine and practice. While there is of course much that we can learn from texts like these, our doctrine and practice should come from the numerous prescriptive texts which are provided for that purpose. For example, Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Once again, the Holy Spirit is synonymous with salvation. Without Him there is no salvation. When we receive salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit in all His fullness. Salvation and Holy Spirit baptism are synonymous in this and many other New Testament texts. I would like to conclude by highlighting a truth that I appreciated in a new light because of this text. In Luke 3.16, John testifies, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Holy Spirit baptism is performed by Jesus and not man. The laying on of hands is not to be equated with this baptism, which only Jesus performs, and which He carries out for every true disciple at the moment of faith and repentance. It is a wonderful truth that each of you has been baptized by Jesus. Have you been baptized by Jesus? Is there evidence in your life, as there was with Apollos, to affirm this? And are you now on fire for God? Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit that we can be assured of our salvation through our faith in you because of the ongoing works and acts of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church today. Lord, if we have lost some of that passion, please renew it. Renew it in a, a wonderfully fresh way so that we might serve, glorify and honor you in all we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.